it's Jane here and welcome to a boiling hot second day of August up at the allotment. Oh my goodness I'm sitting down already and I haven't done anything yet but what I wanted to do is just sort of to share with you today is the sort of bits and bobs I'm going to be doing around the plot to sort of I don't know to sort of a little bit of caring for the crops if you like we've gone past the whole hurly-burly now of planting and sowing and transplanting and getting everything in place and you would think by now as I say early August it would be time for us to almost put our feet up and sit back and just watch the garden grow but it doesn't work like that or at least it doesn't for me because what happens even if you've got the most organized allotment on earth which I certainly haven't um, this time of year is when other things start to take an interest in your crops such as the birds, the blue and aphids and the, the general sort of fungal diseases and nasty things that want to come along and eat up your crops before you do. So for example um, the courgettes of which we're cropping quite a few um, they've got mildew the signs of mildew on their leaves now so what i'm going to do today is show you what i'm going to do to try and prevent that getting any worse um the blueberries keep disappearing and i can't help but think that i don't know if you can pick up that little fellow in the black background but there's certainly a very large pigeon seems to do a bit of hovering over our fruit patch um so i need to do something about that and yeah just have a little general look around see what i can do to sort of take care maintain keep the crops going as well as i possibly can and of course this time of year means i'm going to be doing a little bit of harvesting and i've got something quite special in that polytunnel that i want to share with you <laughs> of course one of the most mundane um, jobs at this time of year if you're trying to prolong the life of your flowers you want to be deadheading them as often as you can I mean I'm using a pair of scissors here you can get snips you can get all sorts but basically the principle is the same if you've got a flower let's let me turn you around and see if you can see if you've got a flower that's looking like this it's clearly past its best what it's going to do those petals as that one's just shown you are going to fall away and leave behind a little rosette of seeds that will ripen, fall off the plant, seed themselves, probably just where you don't want them, so they can carry on next year. So if you want to collect the seeds, I would just leave these on to ripen and then collect them then. But as you can see, I mean, this lot all self-seeded from last year. In fact, nearly all my marigolds did this year. Once you've got them in your plot, you're pretty much stuck with them, which is why I love them so much. But yeah, if I can keep these going, for as long as I possibly can. Brilliant because not only do they look brilliant but as I'll show you later on I'm actually cropping them if you like for the petals to make into things um, special little prezzies for later in the year. So yeah it's really well worth doing it's not really time consuming I mean if most of them you can probably just do with your fingers but then that happens. <laughs> Stick to the snips. another crop if you like that benefits from slightly more than deadheading is um, or are your sweet peas the more you pick the more you will bloom you really don't want them to be able to reach a stage where they are going to be able to sell seeds so the best thing they do with these is once they've provided all that beautiful colour and all that scent in your garden takes them away make them work that little bit harder 
and then plop them in a nice vase. There we go. What we've got here is a rather sad looking blueberry patch. Now in here we've got a mix of early, mid and late season blueberries but they're really not looking too happy at all. They are a little bit yellow which tells me I need to put some more feed on them. Of course they're ericaceous loving plants so it's a special ericaceous feed. Crikey that was tricky. But other than that they do seem to be producing berries but do you think we get to see any of them? No, we don't, because we're actually feeding the local bird population. So, which is actually, if you look on this one here, which is our early season one, it is still getting berries on. It doesn't look quite as washed out as the others, but I must have picked about a handful of berries from that plant. So, it's time to bring out the big guns and cover them all up. Hello. So what I'm basically going to do, whoops, you see that's a raspberry, that shouldn't be there, but that's what they do. What I'm basically going to do is get the, um, get the, the rods that were covering the strawberries and the Envirimesh that were covering strawberries that aren't necessary anymore. I'm going to bring them over here and make a nice little bird free haven for these little buttes. It's a lovely, <laughs> see there's a lovely bird sized hole there for the, them to go in just if they want to take a little shortcut. <laughs> Can't be helped. Okay. I don't know, there's always one isn't there? <laughs> Bless it. Look at that little beauty. I'm not quite sure what it is other than it's a very, very large tomato. <laughs> and I've been looking forward to harvesting it all week, but I wanted to do it while you were with me. So let's have a little go and see how good it is. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness me. Rocky's come to see it happen. I'm going to have to forsake those other tomatoes. Oh no, I'm not actually. Let's give that a little chop there. Oh my word. Would you look at that? I don't know what sort of courgette this is, but it's just as tasty as the others. So off it comes. Okay, let's take a little look at this mildew. Oh, that's a lovely phrase, isn't it? Right, okay. Under there is a courgette leaf and it's very, very common, particularly at this time of year, particularly when we've had such humid weather, for it to be struck by mildew. Now, overall, this sort of amount doesn't really do the plant any harm. It shouldn't weaken the leaves too much, but 
you don't really want it to spread if I show you the one that's actually worse affected which is up here have a look at this one now ultimately if you look at that leaf there it looks like it's been snowing doesn't it that is a fairly badly affected leaf I'm not going to touch it more than I need to and if you notice all over the other leaves you've got your little white spots can you see there I don't know if you can see I think you can there we go which are the little spores that will gradually form almost a powdery coating over your whole leaf now once it does that your leaf is at risk of giving up the ghost and dying and once your leaves start to die back your fruits suffer so what we want to do is try and prevent this from spreading any further at all by making up a little magic potion right then hope you can see me sunlight in my eyes again right one of the simplest things that <laughs> one of the si hello <laughs> i talk about simple things hello one of the simplest things that you can use to um as a preventative measure against mildew on your plants it doesn't just have to be cause yet it's anything that's prone to mildew i mean those marigolds um, that we've got all over the plot they're terrible for mildew at this time of year so get them on that get them on your sweet peas earlier on in the year this lilac can be quite badly affected one of the simplest methods you can use um, to stem its progress is this little fella milk <laughs> nothing else reduced milk um, and it doesn't matter if it's semi skimmed it doesn't matter if it's full fat if it's skimmed whatever it is it's the protein in the milk oh dear that's a little bit off past its best it's the protein in the milk that will help to eat away at the fungus in the mildew so I mean you can use neem oil you can use a neem oil solution you can use baking soda good old baking soda so good for so many things what you have to do with those two things though is um, you also add a liquid soap as well as your water now that just helps it to stick to the leaf one of the problems with that is what a lot of people then start to do and I've done it before is use washing up liquid <coughs> excuse me the problem with that is washing up liquid has got detergent in and you don't really want to be using detergent on your plants so a liquid soap a soft soap is something really that you need and i haven't got any so i've opted for the milk option and all we need to do is basically one part milk to nine parts water so here i have my what shall I, how shall i do it shall i do ounces good old-fashioned ounces I think I will so I'm going to do one ounce of milk on this lovely flat surface <laughs> doesn't really matter that much you know it's not a science experiment the world won't end but your leaves might go a bit manky so I'm just going to go roughly or at least it's not lumpy roughly an ounce of milk and I'm going to top that up to ounces which is roughly 250 grams so here we go oh that's delicious you know when you think in the garden where are we when you think in the garden we have all these lovely smells to contend with don't we your coffee tea your apple tea your monkey milk yeah but they're all things that are good for your garden right okay I've got that I've got my warm water also don't go shocking your plants by um, pouring water straight out of the cold tap they won't like you for it that's been sitting there for a while in the sun that's also been sitting in the sun which explains its state um, and that's it I was going to stir it but as you can see that's okay pour it into my spray bottle that has been thoroughly cleaned out and obviously you're not going to want to keep this around for too long I would say don't keep it for more than a couple of days because it's going to be a bit yeah after that so use it as much as you can on what you can and even if something isn't showing any signs of mildew yet if it's something that is prone give it a spray as a preventative measure preventative preventative okay is that a good shape 
What I'm going to do now, you see I am in full sun, which isn't ideal, but for demonstration purposes only. Oh, and also, if you can do it in the morning, it's better than the evening. Well, it's about four o'clock now, so I think I can get away with it. But all I'm going to do is just spray. Check the sprayer works. <laughs> just make sure Rocky's not over there first. Give that a light spray on top and underneath the leaf and you're just coating that leaf with I mean they're nice and clean those leaves I'm hoping I shouldn't really spray them in direct sun but I'm hoping that might do some good now what I'm going to do I'm going to spray the ones at this end which are the worst affected that one at the end was particularly bad the one I showed you I'm going to leave the one at that end and we'll just see if it makes any difference. I mean, in a way, it's sort of sacrificing that plant a bit, but it would be quite interesting in a week or so to see, one, if it's cured the mildew on that, or at least stemmed it, and two, how that plant's getting on without any spray whatsoever. So yeah, watch this space. Well, would you looky here? <laughs> I'm absolutely thrilled to have just been presented with a bin lid full of uh, pink fir apples because to be honest I forgot we were growing pink fir apples but um, these are those absolutely beautiful beautiful knobbly new potatoes if you haven't grown them before the taste is just I'm not going to say it's like nothing else because I haven't tried every single potato out there but as a waxy salad potato, oh, absolutely beautiful. You might use it for chips. You might not bother with it because it's a bit knobbly. I mean, if you're into peeling all your potatoes, you're not going to be wanting to have something like that, are you? You know, and there's many, oh, he's got, oh, he's on the floor. <laughs> there's many funny little um, anecdotes you could have about what they actually represent, but we're not going to go there. But yeah, I'm really, really pleased with them. What I'm not so pleased about is Mike's just come up and also give me a handful of <laughs> runner beans. And I did ask him where he got them from. And he said, oh, just on the, uh... oh, one second, there's the phone. Yes, well, I wasn't so pleased with them. I'm going to have to move those. Where are you going to go? Where am I going to put you? <laughs> Surrounded by produce. What a beautiful place to be. Um... Oh. There we go. There we go. Yeah. I wasn't so pleased to find out that they're actually my gigantis beans that are obviously supposed to really, really fill up and grow to something about, I don't know, at least double that as they fill out. But no, Mike's gone and picked them all and thought he'd chop them for tea. No words sums that up. But anyway, it's done. It's done. And you know, swings and roundabouts. So what can you do? There's plenty more. But these are just the few things I've picked today, actually. Um, courgettes. The, we've got our, like, these are supposed to be like the little munchkin cucumbers, which you can see we've left to grow far too big. Really, really sweet. We've also got these little, <laughs> little, these are meant to be gherkins. And again, they've got too big, but they're okay. The only thing about those, because they've got so big, the skin started to get a bit tough. So we do peel those but they're great for pickling because you had to start to come in um, and then of course this little fella <gasps> the monster tomato to be honest like I say I mean look look there's my face there's the tomato probably the same color in this sun actually um, but I don't know what it is as I say I've lost my labels I've got a feeling it could be one of the pink heart tomatoes because the there are only a couple of more fruit on that um, plant and they're slightly heart shaped so it could be one of those and what's happened obviously as a young tomato let's see if I can see any stalks there one two three there's about three different stalks in there so it's at least three tomatoes have fused together but I've been dying to pick that but I really wanted to pick it on film. So that will be getting um, pride of place on a nice slice of sourdough bread, I think, with maybe a touch of cheese on top. If not tonight, certainly tomorrow. So really pleased with that. These, um, there's the sweet peas, of course, and the lavender. I'll show you those in a minute. These I picked the other day and actually put over on the Facebook page and the Instagram page um, as my 
well, they were fresh calendula heads when I put them on. And just in the space of a few days, you can see how much they've shrunk. Can you see how much they've shrunk? That was absolutely covered. But as they've dried out, they've started to shrink. And of course, what I'm gonna do when they're completely dry is sort of, well, it's dead easy. Just rub the petals away from the stem, what's left of the stem, and make them into various salves and balms and soaps that will hopefully tick off a few little things on my Christmas present list. And I don't even think about Christmas at this time of year, and I slap my hand for even mentioning it, but be prepared. You know, so there should be, well, I'll certainly be picking more of it, but I certainly should have a good crop of calendula leaves. So that's that, yeah. Sweet peas, that's what you get for deadheading. You've got a beautiful thing to take home. Lavender's gorgeous. I've been given a pot of garlic chives. As you know, I've got several um, loads of, several loads, several clumps of ordinary chives, which I split and split and put around the garden. And I've got those ones that I've planted under the apple tree to try and prevent scab this year, because the central apple was quite badly blighted by scab this year, last year. And so far, touch all wood, there's no sign of scab yet. It might be that it's just going to come later, but you know, I don't know. But yeah, what's lovely about this is now I've got some garlic chives as well. And these, if I'm right, get beautiful, beautiful white flowers on, which are just gorgeous sprinkled in salads, you know, as, as your normal chive flower is, but they're very, very delicate. And they've just got that lovely, sweet taste of garlic without any of the bitter sort of overtaste, overtaste, over, you know what I mean, um, bitter taste that garlic can have, especially if it's slightly burned. So yeah, lovely in a sandwich. So that's them. But the last thing I want to harvest today before I go home are some of my chilies. Look at these. I am really, really pleased. Now I'm going to be quite honest. Oh, I can't see a thing, can you? I'm going to be quite honest. I didn't start my chilies from seed this year. Every other year I have done, and I've had mixed results. A couple of years I had absolutely fantastic results with the chilies. I did think, what am I going to do with them all? Because I'm not a big chilli person. Last year, hardly any of my seedlings came up. And by the time I'd nurtured them to sort of yay height, they were being sold in shops for like, I don't know, 50 pence a pot, the big ones. So this year I went with them, um, I bought a pot of six seedlings, if you like. So they were all ready, well established. I'm saying seedlings, about two or three inches little plantlets um, for three pounds, which was 50 pence each, which actually I thought wasn't too bad. And you can see they are producing absolutely beautiful purple chilies. Now, I don't know the exact variety because it just said chilies mixed. So that's what you get. But all I know is they are not a super duper hot variety. Um, somebody has mentioned a variety to me and I can't remember what it was, but he said it's a medium heat. But I'm gonna take a few of these home fresh. What I tend to do, or what I have done before with my chilies, I've waited till the end of the season until they've more or less started to dry on the plants. So they've changed into all the different colours they're going to. So very often if you get a green one, like with your sweet peppers, they go red. I hope you can see me that sun straight in my eyes again. Like this. Um, I mean, that's green there turning to purple. But yeah, and then I take the plant up, chop all the chilies off and dry them. I either dry them in, um, I'll string them all together and make a pretty little necklace, or I just leave them, leave them in a rack like this. Um, just to dry out. <laughs> the first year I grew them though, and don't do this, I'm touching my face, I shouldn't. Um, I decided to dry all my chilies in the dehydrator. <sighs> that was a lesson and a half. Unless you've got a huge like factory sized kitchen with plenty of ventilation, <laughs> don't dry your chilies in a dehydrator. You couldn't blink when you walked into the room, the, even though it all seems to be sealed. I will move that away, where can, where can I put it? There, oh, even though it's more or less sealed, the unit, the, I don't know, the scent of the chilli, the, um, the power 
of the chilies <laughs> had certainly emanated to such an extent it made your eyes water. So now I go to um, far more basic ways of just leaving them to dry and then putting them in a jar and we have just finished using up the chilies from two years ago. So we've got a good harvest this year that's off me off the chili hook now for the next two years but but yeah so obviously we've got a bit of a little and large thing going on with the tomatoes these never make at home these get munched on the way home in fact mm, I'm still looking um kale is a continual <laughs> just come out with some kale kale is a continual crop at the moment this isn't the Cavolo Nero, this is the thousand headed kale. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um, potatoes this time of year. Oh, you can't see any. Where are we going to put that? Oh my goodness. All of a sudden, it seems to be. I think last video I was saying about it trickling in. And now all of a sudden, you sort of all these things you're bringing big bags up and big baskets and wandering back down the lane with all the produce and it's absolutely wonderful so so yeah not quite into all the preserving yet but that will come in the next few weeks and we're just going to enjoy this while we can so yeah have you been harvesting what's your best thing what's your favorite i can't think of my favorite yet i think something i won't forget in a hurry is this I really hope it tastes as good as it looks because honestly my expectations for this are so so high <laughs> that um yeah I'll let you know how it goes but other than that we're just trundling along I'm hoping that we're not going to get blight either on the tomatoes or the potatoes as I said earlier it has been really really hot over the last few days but with that it's been extremely humid and I don't know about anywhere else, but in the UK, we have something called a Hutton period, which tells you when the uh, conditions are perfect for blight. And I get an email through to tell me when that is happening. And it's been happening pretty much daily now for the last week or so. Um, just wondering what you have here in the States. What do you have? Do you have something similar? Do you have sort of like a pre-warning? Um, so that, yeah, we, we are keeping a very, very close eye on the potatoes. But so far, so good. What are we going to do with all these? It's one of those things, isn't it? How do you store your potatoes? I've always got a problem storing the potatoes. I think what we'll do with these actually is leave them out, not outside, but maybe again on a rack in the greenhouse or in the shed. I saw it everywhere now, in the shed for a couple of days just to dry off so the skins cure a little bit. But saying that, I really fancy taking some of them for tea tonight, so I probably will. Anyway, that's enough of that. Those smell absolutely gorgeous. I wish you could smell them. Um, yeah, <laughs> hope you're all okay. I hope you're enjoying your garden wherever you are and you're not getting too hot in this. I find it oppressive. I'm not a heat fan, but um, just remember to drink loads of water and help each other out. Be nice to each other. Be nice to each other. I've been a lot nicer to people lately. They might, might disagree. He's sitting over there and he's probably chuckling at me. <laughs> he's just shaking his head. Okay, um, as ever, the Instagram links, the Facebook links, they'll all be below. Um, and come and say hi over there because you'll see what we're doing during the week as well as just every now and then. Okay, but uh, yeah, take care of yourselves. I'll see you soon. Bye.